There was a recent product in which we made uh, together with a customer in which we found that the properties of this substitute greener feedstock were far were better than what uh, petroleum-based feedstock it was replacing. And so now you have actually the best of both worlds. You have a greener feedstock and you have better properties of the end use and therefore you see a different and a better market uh, there. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Biomarket Insights TV. My name is Paul MacDonald and I'm delighted today to be joined by Samir Samoya of Godavari Biorefineries. Hi Samir, how are you today? Doing very well, thank you. Great to see you, great to see you. So, Excited Samir, to be here. So Samir, today's episode is entitled At the Forefront of the Global Bio Revolution for 83 Years. Our viewers are going to be really interested to learn about farmer welfare, ideation and the co-creation process, the growing bio-based chemicals sector, what exciting innovative products are in the pipeline and principles that go beyond a mission statement. So loads of really good stuff to get our teeth sunk into. So Godavari began life in 1939 as a manufacturer of sugar and is now one of the largest producers of ethanol-based chemicals in India. You have an incredibly diverse portfolio of products serving a wide range of industries. Um, perhaps you can give me an overview of the business, please. Thank you for this opportunity, Paul. It's, been, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you mentioned, we were founded in 1939 and primarily to start the manufacture with sugar from sugar cane. And today we convert primarily cane, but not only cane, into a whole variety of products, foods such as sugar, biofuels such as ethanol, electricity, biochemicals, and biomaterials. We do that by the physical, chemical, and biological transformation of biomass. We work with over 20,000 farmers, and in our business today, sugar comprises a little less than 30% of our business Chemicals are about 35% and ethanol also about 30% and the other products are being there. And so we make many thousand tons of biochemicals in our business and we are very excited with the opportunity we see that the world is looking for these bio transformation and environmentally friendly products. Great and, and thank you and you yourself have been with Godavari for I think over 29 years. So um, what's your background? So my background is, uh, you know, I studied chemical engineering in a bachelor's and a master's degree from Cornell University. I also did an MBA over there. And then I did a master's of public administration, a mid-career at Harvard University. I actually, Godavari is a family business. It was founded by my grandfather in 1939 to make sugar from cane. And over time, it was continued by my father to make chemicals and ethanol from the molasses that came from the sugar industry. When I returned 29 years ago, India was changing. The import substitution world was changing into a more competitive world of more freer movement of goods and money as that was happening. And the company's business was turning difficult. At that time, I was challenged by my father to see whether my chemical engineering knowledge could be put to good use <laughs> and make products that would be innovative and and work in this environment. That was a choice. That was a period of low oil prices. And we committed ourselves to working and creating a research program that would come up with products that would be able to be competitive in a global world, which would be sustainable, renewable and green. And so that's my background. And I'm delighted that in fact, in my team, we have a organic chemist as an executive director, Sangeeta Srivastava, she's there, and Mr. Bakshi, who is a farmer, and they're both very important for our future. Your father sounds like a pretty um, inspirational and challenging man. Well, he might have had a uh, much higher expectation of what <laughs> chemical engineers can do. <laughs> that was quite a surprise for me to, to hear him say that. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, you've got such a rich history. I mean, it's... Um... It's really, really uh, amazing. Um, so listen, I, I recently read an interview um, where you said that 
sustainability is about environmental, social and financial sustainability. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, I think uh, for a business to prosper and to grow and to be relevant, you need to address all these items of sustainability. I think financial sustainability in mathematical terms is a necessity, but it's not sufficient. To be sufficient, you need to be a player of the community and you need to also be uh, making uh, a contribution to the community and you need to make sure that you are environmentally responsible. Now, how would I deal with that? The prosperity in the community, uh, we always said in our family that prosperity cannot simply be um, for yourself alone, for your company alone. The prosperity has to be also for the community. So we have to work in the world of education and healthcare. But environmental sustainability would be renewable feedstocks. Environmental sustainability could be products that are more sustainable. There could be cascading or a what today we call a circular economy. And also we talk about regenerative agriculture, agriculture that would, which would make the soil stronger for the, the future. And I think, uh, so that's how we mean in terms of sustainability that is social, environmental and financial. Great. And I think we um, right at the end of this episode, we, we talk a little bit about some of the um, sort of social sustainable um, initiatives that, um, that your company is involved in. Um, and you just mentioned about regenerative agriculture um, uh, and, and keeping the soil rich. Now, you work with, I think you just said 20,000 sugarcane farmers, which is an That's incredibly right high volume, a uh, high number. So they're clearly very important to you. And I imagine they rely on your business. So how do you support the farmers so that their business can flourish and continue to provide you with the raw materials that you require? So in India, 20,000 farmers is a huge number of farmers, and but they're all small farmers. Most of them will have land area in the range of one, two or three acres. So the question of sustainability for them, which is financial and environmental, is extremely crucial. So the question is for them, firstly, financial sustainability is, necess is necessary, just like it is for us. The way we try to intervene with them is we run a separate uh, agriculture research institute. Now, this institution works with taking lab ideas into the field. But now what ideas of the lab do you want to take into the field? So those are carefully thought out. If water consumption is issue, can you work with them to implement drip farming on, on their fields? Uh, how do you put in what kind of farm inputs? Is it evidence-based? Do you look at what the soil needs and then do you determine that? Are there intercrops that you can do? Engineers normally don't think of it in that sense, but intercrops is, can I put a separate crop in the middle uh, of, of sugarcane rows and get multiple outputs for farmers. Can we use principles of uh, remote sensing uh, uh, there so that the farmer can get inputs from the new day? Can we use philosophies and old age practices from agroecology so that you get a much richer soil microbiome as you go forward? So this is how we work with them. So the farmers should have lower input costs, better yields and multiple yields and so that is then giving them not only the financial sustainability, but also environmental sustainability as they go forward. I mean, and, and, and that all sounds you know, very, very positive, clearly, for the farmers. Do they, do they embrace that? Is there, is there any sort of form of resistance or pushback for any reason? Oh, no, I think uh, there, there is no pushback for that. But it takes time to take an in, to introduce a practice and to get it to spread in. So you need lead users, uh, you need demonstration plots, lead in. So, you know, we work in about 200 villages. So, you know, when you go to these villages, you need a whole group of what we'll call lead users and then people who learn from them. And that's what you need to work. As I mentioned in the beginning, one of the executive directors of our company, he is actually a farmer, uh, extremely well uh, qualified farmer who understands and in this day and age of supply chain disruptions, it's very important that you have your supply chain, in this case, the earth, the farmer and the biomass connected to you uh, for making sure you have a business that is far more resilient. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Now I know that you are. I mean, we've 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 already just touched on it, but I know you are very passionate about the role and benefits of co-creation within your business. So perhaps you can give me an overview of the co-creation process, who you partner with, and some examples of the types of products that you you co-create. So the the world is you know, uh, rapidly changing. And then there is today a realization that climate change has to be addressed and that we have to, as a planet, as a people, as a community and as individuals, we need to pivot towards more sustainable products, processes and consumption norms. As a result of which many of our, I will say collaborators or customers especially in response to their own end use customers or because of their own boardroom commitment or maybe because of a regulatory new deal are making climate change commitments or commitments to moving towards more sustainable ag inputs or sustainable or renewable feedstocks. And so we have been working with customers and consumers across the world, whether it be Japan, Korea, China, Europe, the Middle East, uh, USA and we've been working with them and they know that we do work in, in renewable chemistry or using biological processes. So often we will come into conversation, is this something that we can do together? Then the thought process is, is this a drop in, which is a direct substitute? And if it is a direct substitute, what is the difference in the impurity profile? You might get the purity profile, right? And separately, if it is not a drop in, so what is the application that this product is meant to serve and what are the properties it is supposed to deliver in its subsequent process. Now, this process now this collaboration between us and our potential or current customers will take a time and patience in which we work with each other. We work from our ideation together. We work with our labs, our pilot plants together, and then maybe we'll do semi-commercial facility or a commercial facility. So it takes a lot of patience, but it's very exciting and it's very rewarding when it works right. It also means that not every project works. Some of them are of course going to fail, but it also means that some of them are going to succeed. So that's how we work across uh, the world with many of our collaborators. And have you seen, I suppose, co-creation, unity, collaboration, especially when you're talking about planetary protection. You know, you're hearing those words a lot because we need to come together because I have a very simple philosophy, which is, you know, the more people you can get around the table, um, the quicker, the more likely you're going to accelerate a transition or you're going to get to the right um, answer or solution to the problem. Now, so are you finding a greater thirst for co-creation compared to sort of five years ago? Yes, for sure. Okay. Because many, many companies have made commitments which you can even see on their uh, websites that this is what they're going to do. And these targets are quantified in time as well as in quantity, what they want to do. So then there is definitely, as that strategy unfolds, there is a greater thirst to use your language to go forward doing it. Um, that said, you could, there was a recent product in which we made uh, together with a customer in which we found that the properties of this substitute greener feedstock were far were better than what uh, petroleum based feedstock it was replacing. And so now you have actually the best of both worlds. You have a greener feedstock and you have better properties of the end use and therefore you see a different and a better market uh, there. So I think these are also things that may come up in your conversation. Yeah. Okay. I mean, or yeah. in the results of that collaboration, not conversation. Yeah. 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 Okay. There's a couple of things there that I want to unpick that you mentioned about the substitute product being better than the incumbent fossil derived um, product. So um, I've got a few questions around this. Number one is, should we stop referring to them as substitute products because they're actually improvement products. Yeah. The only, yeah you know, I, you're not going to know that when you start off and that's why it's a co-creation. 
you might have that the substitute production is slightly inferior, uh, but it might still meet a particular different segment of product that that customer wants to use it for. And in that particular segmentation, it makes no difference in its properties. Uh, there could be a case when it is exactly the same in what it delivers. And the third is it is actually superior. And then you find yourself not only doing what you set out to do, but you set out, you created a whole new market segment, uh, which provided a different and a more growing opportunity. So we've, so you, you know, that's co-creation. Uh, you don't know from when you started what you're going to end up with. You set out a goal, where you end up uh, is 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 the fun in it. <laughs> yeah. and there, there is the voice of experience who is yes. from someone who's done this versus someone that hasn't that thinks yeah. you can do a superior product. So that that that's very interesting. Um, no, but, but just to but just just just, just I want to. I'm sorry. And when I said an inferior here is not to be looked at in in that you know negative context so there is something we have done with someone where they found that the properties may not work for what they turned out to be but it worked for a different product that they wanted to do so you found a different market segment maybe a different price point compared to where both of us may have set out to be but in here i, th I guess inferior is not the right word to use it could be different uh yeah, different yeah yeah yeah. And those, as you said, those opportunities will only present themselves with good, healthy, respectful yes. relationships and collaborations, don't they? So yes. you never, as you right. say, you never know where the journey or the path will take you. Sometimes, right? Exactly. And um, so, I, I suppose, what is the key to replacing? fossil fuel based products with superior in an ideal world with superior performing bio based products. Um, and what do you have in the pipeline? And are there any challenges that you would like to issue to potential co creators and, and partners? I think the first one is mindset. Uh, when you ask, you know, fossil derived product so there'll be less of the resource tomorrow than you had today. In a renewable biomass derived product, if you did it right, then you could have as much this year as you did last year. And so I think that's first is a mindset. And if you understand, change the mindset, then you will have a better imperative of trying to make this move. The second point I think is that it is possible to work on solutions to get the product performance, what you want to do. Now it could be a skincare product, it could be in cosmetics, especially that's where we see a lot of demand coming, uh, where customers want, because I think in their end use, which is their B2C businesses, where their end use customers are demanding a more gentler product, a more sustainable product and a light footprint product, not only footprint on their skin, but a light footprint on the planet. So I, I think you really need to sit down together. You need to think about these co-creation challenges. We need to have patience that these things, you know, you've lived off a particular fossil mindset for a long time. Is it possible? So you got to think it is possible, work on it, put an ingredient of patience in it. And as I said in the beginning, that some of these projects may not succeed, but at the same time, many of them will. We would be very happy to collaborate with our customers or potential customers who have set themselves a challenge of wanting to pivot towards renewable, sustainable and climate friendly feedstock to sit there and work with them with the urgency and the patience required to develop these products. Okay, fantastic. So that's, a, so that's the, the challenge to sort of get together, sit around a table and have that blend of urgency and patience to, to find the right strategy for the future. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we have customers in Japan, Korea, China, as I said earlier, the Middle East, Europe, USA, 
you know, and of course, India, which is a very incredibly growing market across the board, you have, you know, cost con considerations, regulatory considerations, quality considerations, consistency considerations, and continuity considerations. And that's true for any business. But I, I, I think we've got relationships that have, as I said, spanned these geographies and have spanned time uh, of, you know, decades of working with some of the very, very demanding customers once you deliver. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a delight to be able to rise to the challenge. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, so um, Samir, we're, we're starting to come towards the end of the, the, the episode now. So thank you for your, for, for your insight so far. Um, a, a final question or a final bit of insight that I think our viewers would be really, really interested about. And we've touched on it a little bit throughout, the, throughout this episode, but Godavari is part of the Samaya group of companies. And I know that the Samaya group is incredibly strong social and environmental principles that go far beyond your mission statement. Um, why is that important to you? Give me a little bit of history. Give me a little bit of an insight into, into what you guys do. So I think the history here, the legacy, as I would say, is my grandfather who founded it. He was born very poor and it was a rented hut that he was born in. And he often thought that the opportunity is best made through the gift of education. And of course, good health is also necessary to take those opportunities forward. So there was a there's a very nice Sanskrit saying uh, called Shatahasta Samahara Sahasrahasta Sankira, meaning earn with a hundred hands and give with a thousand. And so that was what he really thought we should do, as a result of which uh, he stepped down from Godavari uh, as an executive uh, uh, member in 1959 at the age of 57, and he created a huge educational institution which has more than 40,000 students under its wings today as a resident student, I mean, as a population of students. And I think that's what drove him. And as a family, we have continued that legacy and continue to build on it to create a better world, um, again, environmentally and socially for everyone and understanding fully well that, you know, financially we have to be there to make this future happen. Well, I mean, it's incredible, um, in incredible. And I think to see um, for anybody that's watching this, you know, go to your website because all of the information is there. I've spent a lot of time on it, obviously, getting ready to, to interview you. And I think also, the depth, the depth of the things you do and for how long you've been doing them is, is very, you know, is incredibly impressive. You know, so a lot of people are new to this purpose, including myself, you know, and it's a good thing, right? It's good that people are trying to work out how do we give back? How do we make society uh, a little bit fairer, um, a little bit more equal? Um, and, and, and what purpose above pure, financial metrics of revenue, profit and margin, can I apply to my business? So I think it's very you know, inspirational what, what, what you've been doing for, for what, 83 years now? Yeah, well, I think uh, very strongly, uh, you know, the family believes in innovation. It believes in the power of individual enterprise. It believes in teamwork too, and it believes in dreaming. Uh, but, but having, um, having got success the idea is then to use that to continue that growth and but also to have and work towards social equity and a more inclusive society yeah. excellent that's a that's a, a great a great point to finish our our interview i think on that it's a very excellent and positive note so Thank before you. the before we end this episode i'd just like to invite any collaborative bio pioneers to feel free to contact me at paul at biomarketinsights.com and let's explore what we can do together um, so samir that pretty much wraps up our conversation um, on behalf of myself and our viewers from all around the world i'd like to thank you for your time your insights and wish you and all of your team all the very best for the future so thank you very much thank you for the opportunity a the pleasure and hopefully i shall see you soon Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.